What is going on, guys? Welcome back to the Daily Dose of Wood podcast. I lost my voice a little bit, but I got one of the biggest NBA players to ever play the game. I'm talking in size of heart, but shortest on the court. We got Muggsy Bogues with us. Muggsy, what's going on? Yeah, not much, big fella. How you doing? Good, man. I'm excited to hear, you know, about your time, what you've done on and off the court. We'll get into it all. I got to ask you, though, what it was like going back, growing up as a kid in Baltimore, a gunshot wound at the age of five, man. Walk me through that. Oh, yes, yes. Well, you know, as a kid growing up in the inner city, Baltimore was challenging at that time, you know, in the early 60s, uh, early 70s. You know, I happened to be five years old, been at the wrong place at the wrong time, snuck out the house. Mom and I didn't think I know where I was outside. And, you know, a fight broke out and, and one of the guys broke over Ch- old man Chester's window uh, after doing the fight, and he just came out of his store and ran straight to his shed and grabbed his double barrel shotgun and started shooting up in the neighborhood. And, you know, unfortunately, I got hit with uh, buckshots, and fortunately that I didn't get hit with the bullets. And, uh, but it was buckshots all over your legs. You know, as a kid, you know, you thought it was all over with, you know, lying in that what, you know, you wake up in the hospital uh, all patched up and so forth. Uh, but, you know, it was, uh, again, I think it was a mindset change for me. So you've been beating the odds since day one. You've been proving people wrong. Tell me why you chose Wake Forest as your go-to college. Well, Wake Forest at the time, it just was the best situation for me. You know, uh, playing on one of the greatest high school basketball teams. They, everybody's saying this has probably ever been a summer with the Baltimore boys, with Dunbar High School, with alongside with the late Reggie Lewis, may he rest in peace, uh, Reggie Wingate, I mean, David Wingate, Reggie Williams and myself, I mean, and then we had some talented players as well alongside of that. I mean, at the time we was a hot number one team in the nation and a lot of folks was trying to come after those guys at the time. So I want to make sure I put myself in a situation where I can be highly recruited and Wake was one of those schools. and. When I took my visit, you know, even though it was a cultural shock, you know, coming from where I came from in the city and Wake, it was a little small uh, country town uh, with a, just with a big university there, actually small university with a big impact, I should say that it had on this, on the city as well as the, the state. Um, Danny Young was a senior. I felt like, again, the situation was suited for me. If it didn't work out on the court, I knew academically it'd be a good, situation if I got my degree there. So, and then, you know, it was the best conference in in the lead after, in the country at the time. You know, the likes of the Michael Jordans, the Spud Webb, the Kenny Smith, the Brad Doherty's and the James Worthy of the world. So that was a place where I wanted to play. I felt like if I could be successful there, then I could be successful That's what, um, in the yeah. next level going forward. Shortest player to ever play at, at 5'3". I'm sure you got some oohs and eyes when you came into stadiums. What are some of the craziest reactions you've ever seen or gotten when when playing? Well, you know, of course, a lot of folks didn't believe a guy my size was out there doing the things I was doing. And, it, and I always said it, you know, just quizzes, and quizzes mind just needed to know. And, uh, but, you know, the mindset that you take on the court that, you know, if I play with the best or I play against the best and if I had success against the best, I need to be included with the best. You know, so out there, you know, tricking the guys and stealing the basketball from them and bringing them down to a level to where they didn't realize that a kid this size is controlling the game, you know, on both ends of the floor, you know, they can't get into the offense. Here it is, he running behind me, throwing up low alley-oops or going by me, laying the ball up, just making me look silly, you know, uh, for a guy that size to be doing this to me. So, you know, that was a good good feeling to have knowing that you have came, you know, you've overcome and that you can overcome to the point to where now, you know, you more or less in control of games and you only have to score a point and you have that understanding of it to where, you know, a guy my size wasn't thought about to be able to have that much impact on the floor because, you know, Don Meyer was always big odds, big odds, big odds. Do you remember when you put back your first dunk? Well, you know, I was in, of course, you're young, you know, and I, I was in, just in practice. You know, it was a tip dunk, and it wasn't nothing that was, that stood out for me, for me, because it's something that I always, you know, felt like I was able to do is catch, tip it. Uh, and dunking was a big issue for me. 
And I always just mess around because I had small hands and I couldn't palm the ball, but I could always palm up a volleyball. You know, so anytime that, you know, the thing just came off uh, or uh, opportunity that you can go up and tip it back in and you get it, I always count that as my dunk. And, yeah. Uh, you know, because, you know, you had, I had a 44 inch vertical. And uh, when those are the things that, you know, just kind of always kind of, you know, it, it don't really stand up because I always look at two as two, but, you know, it's right up there. Was that something God given or was that something that you worked on like to get that high or a little bit of both? Oh, uh, definitely both. Definitely God given. Uh, but also the uh, the things that I did uh, naturally, I rode my bicycle a lot because I didn't believe in running, riding, uh, lifting weights. And I think riding in that bicycle everywhere I good with as a kid, it built my quads and my hamstrings. And I had really strong legs. And uh, and it allowed my vertical my vertical my verticality to be able to, you know, to continue to increase, yeah. and uh, and I always use that as a mechanism because when guys try to just throw the ball, I always jump, and use that as a, a, another means of you know me playing, playing defense as opposed to just stand on the ground and just let them throw the ball over your head. Yeah, I watched a very motivational video that you did with Mulligan Brothers or an interview that you're doing and you were talking about, you know, just like I said before, beating the odds and always blocking out the outside noise, getting hatred for being, you know, one of the smaller guys in such a tall sport. What are some of the things that you learned early on that you needed to do in order to keep going and not let others' opinions be your own? Well, to have the confidence within yourself, you know, that's where it all starts for the foremost. And uh, because then you don't allow those outside noise to enter. Um, and I think, and again, it, it, I, I always related back to my early age when I did get shot and when I was hearing all those negativity, you know, before all that took place, you know, and they kind of used to, you know, creep in your mind and always make you upset. You go home and tell your moms, you know, how cruel the kids were and your mother didn't even have no idea what basketball was, out, but she, was about, but she knew that her son was upset and not happy. And she always just tell you, Ty, no one could be an expert on your life. No one can you know, no one know your capabilities, know your potential. You know, you can be whatever you want to be. If you want to play basketball, you go right here and play it. And that always, as a kid, you know, it's just motherly advice, but as a kid, like, yeah, okay, mom. But as you got older, it kind of resonated with you, you know, because they didn't have control of me. You know, they didn't know what my capabilities, know my potential was, you know, and I knew that. And I knew more that I obtained information of the game. The more I studied the game, the more I practiced the game, the more I become more skillful at the game. And then I have my last, you know, I have the last, you know, the last thing to say in terms of, you know, in terms of being out there to, to show the type of impact that I have. So those are the things that I understood again. And it, I think it goes back to when I was a kid being shot, not being cared about what folks said to you and um, knowing that you was the one that's pretty much in control. And I think I understood that early on and it allowed me to be able to block out the notes as I got older. Moving over to the NBA, your time there, you play with guys like Del Curry and saw Steph Curry as a kid. What was he like as a kid? And did, did you know that, you know, maybe this kid could be great? I see he's got it in him. No, we had no idea if Steph going to be the, the kid or the man that he turned out to be as a basketball player. You know, Dell and I played fortunate enough to play 11 years together, you know, nine in Charlotte and two in Toronto. And him and my kids already, Steph and my kids always played around with each other, Seth as well. And um, and they always hung around in the locker room. And I mean, they got a video showing me giving them a little airplane ride when he was, you know, five years old um, in the locker room. And that's how much he was around and how much he was soaking up information, believe it or not. And even when we went to Toronto, they even showed video of him playing one-on-one -on -one with Vince Carter. You know, that goes and all that goes a long way because that's something that stands with you. And that, as a kid, you know, that especially when you got a dream of where you want to go, those are the things that kind of allow you to, you know, keep growing and, and believing and, and dreaming and have, having that experience and them being able to follow it from there to all the way to where it is and him becoming a two-time MVP, unanimous first time ever and, you know, three-time NBA champion. And it's just so much that he's accomplished and more so off the court with him and his wife, Aisha, and the things that they have done. Um, with the community and so forth. I'm just so proud of him as him, not on him and Seth and what and with Sonya and Steph and Dell was able to do in order 
to allow the kids to grow, to reach their full potential. And for him to, you know, to take it on to this level, to be known now as one of the greatest, it's known as the greatest shooter to ever play this game right now, is very special. Yeah, it's crazy. He's come a long way. And it's, it's a different game now, the NBA, from when you played to what it is now. What are your thoughts on how the game has changed and seeing super teams like the Brooklyn Nets and the Warriors playing now and being in the championship back-to-back years? Well, maybe not the Nets yet, but potentially being up the championship. Well, I'm happy to see where the lead is today. Of course, it has changed since we've uh, played, and it has changed – you know, even when we were playing to the guys before us, they have changed. And that's the nature of the NBA, the revolving door. And that's the growth of the league. You know, now we have so many international players in the league, over 100 players that it's become global. You know, we got a lot of kids now dreaming about, you know, wanting to be that NBA player in their country where basketball wasn't the first sport at the, you know, in their country. Uh, but, you know, we always had those big, type of uh, big threes that you call it, those dynasty teams, you know, the Chicago even go back from Larry Bird and Kevin McHale and Robert Price and Dennis Johnson to the magic and the worthy days, you know, uh, but you're seeing more so now that a lot of the top stars, these superstars are moving uh, to franchises we didn't have back then and um, to where they taking on and joining forces with one another and be creating these dynasties, which you got to, you know, appreciate where the lead is today and be thankful that, you know, Adam Silver, you know, has a pulse on and understand he's a player's lead and these guys are really understanding that and they're trying to take advantage of it. And I think the lead is benefiting from it. Sure. Yeah. There's nobody who's necessarily near your height right now in the NBA, but do you see any guys who carry a similar style that you use when you used to play? No style, no comparison, because, you know, I played the game but totally different. But height-wise, I mean, we got guys that still represent that and the Trey Young, you know, still out there playing. And, you know, a little Titus Jones as well um, are still out there. So we got guys that are still out there representing, you know. Well, I guess Kyrie's, you know, Kyrie's still 6'1", 6'2", you know, so they ain't considering that little small stature stage as well. I wouldn't put them in that category. But we still got guys that's out there representing it. And I'm loving what the uh, the leaders continue to do and continue to shine and knowing that it is now, it, I don't want to say it's become a God's lead, but you got a lot of guards that's really uh, become stars in our league and, uh, and becoming the face of the franchises where it normally be, you know, the wing guys are getting that attention, but now it's getting it's to be a little combination of both. 100%. Looking back on your career, when you think of all the memories that you you had, you made, what would you say stands out as one of the top memories for you? Well, you know, memory wise, you know, always just the relationships that you built with the players, you know, all the guys that, you know, you, you know, you built a bond with from the teams that you've been on, you know, I was with Charlotte for nine years and went on and played, you know, I had, I guess, a great relationship with a lot of guys that came through that organization, you know, and it's hard to list them all, but you know, there's so many from the large Johnsons that the, Alonzo, the Dell Curry, the Johnny Newman, and Glenn Rice, and so forth. Um, we just had so many. Um, um, and then from my time in Golden State, you know, I had some good relationships when I was there, even though it was short lived, uh, but it was great. And uh, then went on to Toronto and built some wonderful with the young guys and Vince and Tracy and Oak and uh, Antonio Davis, D. Brown, Alvin Williams, and so forth. And it was a great relationship. I mean, great bondage that we was able to do. So I always let that stand out as opposed to games because there were so many games that you played. Right. You know, and you don't want to just highlight one of all, but I always put the relationships that I built with my guys. Yeah, and now you got your own podcast, some skin in the game and the podcasting game with some of those guys that you just mentioned. Is that kind of why you started it? You wanted to, you know, reminisce on some of those good memories that you had and those relationships and getting other guys on to talk? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, especially where we are today in society with the pandemic had created so many opportunities in terms of just, you know, sitting around and, and wondering what's going on, what about the game. And, you know, a lot of things has been talked about, you know, and creating podcasts. And this is something that, you know, me and my guys can be able to just gather our friends and talk to a lot of people, just chit chat, reminisce about today's society, things that's happened in today's world about their career, where they are today. Um, and, you know, that 3OG, 
the three lead OG podcasts that we created with myself, the Charles Oakley, and uh, Earl Curriton, um, two-time champion, as well as Ashley Strollin, who's a, a, a star right within herself, and she keeps everybody evenly killed, and uh, and she brings the beauty to the cast. There we uh, go. So uh, we have a lot of fun, man, just chatting it up. We just released our fifth episode with Ron Harper and Spud. That was uh, that had a great time on it, and you know we had the likes in uh, the Lonzo Money, Vince Carter, as well as. Uh, uh, Steve Smith, NFL Hall of Famer, uh, Rex Chapman, and got a great lineup coming on with Candace Parker and Dickie Vitale and the, the Isaiah Thomas. So we uh, we enjoying ourselves and having some fun with it. There we go. And you can find that on any podcasting platform, right? All, all platforms that we out there on. And uh, so uh, Amazon, Spotify, you name it, YouTube. So we out there. What was that transition for you, you like after the game was over? moving on into the charity work and then, you know, the media side, how did, how did you handle that? Well, for me, you know, I was always trying to make that transition before I even got out the league. You know, I was in real estate and real estate was one of my big uh, interests at the time and did that for quite some time, all the way from 2099 to 2007, to where a lot of things start to slow down. And, uh, and then I start to diversify, I start to simplify my life and, start selling off a lot of my properties and so forth. Uh, but the nonprofit organization always been an interest in me. I started in 99 when my mom was with us. And then when I lost in 2001, I kind of shut it down. Um, and then my daughter, you know, when she graduated in 09 from Wake Forest, she kind of grabbed me by the wayside and said, Dad, we need to get this thing back on again. So we reached, opened it up in 2013, um, the Muggsy Bose Family Foundation, uh, you can find that at mugglyboatsfamily.org and go and check out what we're all about. You know, we, we try to provide scholarship vocational students, um, try to strengthen their uh, families and take the burden off a lot of their parents and uh, make sure uh, we have resources for them because a lot of resources are more catered to the IT kids, IT students. So we want to make sure that, you know, these vocational kids that still want to have aspirations of, you know, staying and going to a two-year university and, and become very you know, successful in, in today's society. You know, we got that avenue for them. And then we added another program where we provide meals for less fortunate families. Uh, we try to create a uh, program where we can kind of, you know, we got a 30 for 30 campaign going on to where we want to feed families three meals a week um, and making sure that they have opportunities to know that they got someone out here in those costs because of the situation that we in. Um, everybody need to help a hand and we're just trying to see if we have a, a need for them, the answers for them, and they can be able to go to our, you know, foundation reorganization to reach out and we can be able to assist them with those needs. That's great. We're going to put the link in, in our bio. We'll get that out to our listeners for anyone who wants to donate. I always say the impact off the court, you know, is so much greater. The amount of people that you're, you could affect in, in a positive way is unbelievable. And now you're with the Hornets, right? Doing Are you doing work with the Hornets too? Yeah, I'm still with the Hornets serving as an ambassador for them, um, as well as the NBA. Um, um, you know, we're doing that and just trying to, you know, seeing what the Hornets are doing this year, you know, the excitement that they got with the young fellas. And I've um, also created a podcast uh, with my boy Sam. And we all on Believe and um, all the platforms, Spotify as well. So we got a, a podcast that we got going to cover the Hornets. And I mean, this year it could be great to be covering the Hornets because all the excitement with the Mello and Gordon Haywood. And these guys are really bringing some excitement to the table uh, with the young guys and Miles Bridges as well. I mean, Miles Bridges as well as PJ Washington. So I wish fans could come into the arena because I know it, it feel like it was back when we had that crowd and electrifying and the type of play that Mello out there dishing the dimes and bring those highlight reels would be exciting for the fans. How'd that uh, relationship go from being Michael Jordan, the uh, competitor opposition team to the Michael Jordan, the businessman, your guys' relationship? Well, MJ always been, you know, business oriented. You know, I guess when he got an opportunity to, you know, purchase the team and come back to his home state, you know, he, you know, he relished with that, you know, being able to be one of the, former players, one of the faces of the lead, and then all of a sudden now being one of the minority owners of a lead, I mean, it's historic. And 
things that he's done for the state, for the community, for the city has been overwhelming. Um, you know, continuously, you know, during the hurricanes, he was able to reach out and provide resources for the family. So he's done a lot of things um, for this state and for this community. And now starting to reap a lot of the rewards. We're well, not quite yet, but a little more potential excitement and with his product, the team that they're putting out there on the floor right now. Yeah, it looks like it's all coming together. It's building up. And I feel like that that time is coming soon for you guys at the Hornets over there. Last question wrapping up here. This has been great. I want to leave leave our listeners with something positive. What what are some advice tips that you could give to, you know, keeping a positive mindset? Well, for one, you know, treat one as equal, you know, um, human being and human human race is the most and foremost at the forefront of everybody. You know, we all uh, come from different places and different backgrounds and it's all should be accepted, you know, to agree to disagree is always good. And that's how we always grow. But at the last of the day, we all equally and uh, we know one is bigger, better than the next person. And I think if we can have that respect for each and, you know, person that we look across the aisle you know, we could be in a much better place, a much better world. And uh, I think with that understanding, I think the younger generation, you know, will continue to change it and continue to make sure that we all understand that it's about inclusion and not about excluding anyone out of anything, about everybody should be treated equally, you know, across the board. Thank you again, Muggsy. This has been great. Look forward to see what you continue to do off the court and uh, we'll be in touch. I appreciate you having me, partner. Keep on doing what you do.